Good evening and welcome to the Construction Collective show for, what, what is this, third, fourth time? I can't really remember. Oh, yeah. um, I'm your host, Mark Anthony, over there, resplendent as ever. He's my co-host, Peter Haddock. Uh, now, as many of you will be aware, uh, we're just coming to the end of National Apprenticeship Week here in the UK. So tonight's show is designed to focus on what I believe is the greatest single challenge, but also the greatest single opportunity facing the construction industry right now, and that is skills. Now, before we get into the meat of the show, uh, a couple of very quick points. Uh, we want your input. Um, Peter and I are quite happy to sit here and talk to ourselves, but we'd much rather get some comments and some feedback from you. So if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, please use the comments function to take part in the show. Um, also, we've got some very new and some very understated new stickers that you can grab as well. Uh, if you'd like to get yourself one of those, then please drop me a Oh, Peter's actually got one on the board there, which I, I hadn't spotted earlier. Um, you can... Sticker? Oh, come on, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want to drop me a line... Um, all things being equal, I think my email address is running across the bottom of the screen right now. Uh, drop me a line there and we'll get you hooked up with um, with a sticker or two. Now, I've never done an apprenticeship. Uh, I've had precious little training. Um, and although my slick professionalism probably leads you to believe otherwise, I'm a man largely devoid of skills. But skills is a subject that's very close to my heart. But it's even closer to the heart of my co-host, Peter, who seems to spend his every waking hour talking about the subject and generally evangelising about construction as a viable career path. So, Peter, to kick things off, why is this subject so important? And more specifically, why is it important right now? Right, Mark. The biggest thing that we need in this industry is we need to actually bring more people into it that I want a career in this industry. And I'm, I don't care what people say. I still talk to people about construction and they go, oh, I don't want to go outside in the rain or and just making brick walls and things like that. Constructions, oh, it's not for me. Well, we are currently in the, the strangest period that we're ever going to probably be in for decades. And the one industry that is really working hard and is working is the construction industry. And the thing about that is, you know, we go into recessions first, we come out of recessions first, but we actually create the infrastructure, the buildings, the services, the utilities, in particular, what we need right now, which is the internet to communicate. And people don't understand what we do. And the construction is massive. And we've got some massive projects, particularly my favorite project, Mark, HS2. And we need to attract not just tens or hundreds. We need to attract thousands of people into this industry right now. And the skill sets of the people that are unfortunately losing their jobs um, are really, really needed in construction as we up our game and all the rest of it. So it's a great industry to be in. But we don't shout from the rooftops and tell people why. And that's really frustrating, Mark. No, I think you're absolutely right. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned um, HS2 because I, that is going to be a huge draw on, on our human resources. Um, and obviously, um, a lot of companies are, to, are now starting to focus on, on addressing that very situation. Um, one of those companies is the good folks at Flannery. You've been to see them, Peter. I have indeed, Mark, and I got a sneak peek exclusive first interview at the Operator Skills Hub, Mark, with Paul Skitt, who precisely one year ago, I'm at a Westmidlands Combined Authority event where people were talking to people with no masks on, and he said to me, are we going to get a skills training hub up? And I said, really? You know, you haven't even built anything? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do it, Peter. So enough of talking about me. Let's hear from me talking to Paul at the brand new Operator Skills Hub, uh, their HS2 depot in Coles Hill near Birmingham. The last time I was talking about this, the Operator Skills Hub, was it was just a dream, really. Paul Skitt is the actual development director and skills director here at Flannery Plant Hire. A year ago, we were talking at the West Midlands Combined Authority event, National Apprenticeship Week. Uh, we were still planning it. But now the Operator Skills Hub is a reality. And yeah, week two into the Trailblazer apprenticeship, it's fantastic. We've been working on getting that apprenticeship standard approved for three years. And now, as you've, as you've seen, 
Uh, the first cohort started two weeks ago and they're having a great experience, initial experience and we really uh, have got big things planned for them in their careers. And folks, don't worry, I've got this covered because I've just interviewed two of your trailblazers. One young man that's actually 29 years old and one young woman that's actually starting out in her career. And I'm going to be following those individuals and they've come for very different reasons, haven't we? So this is trailblazer scheme is not just an apprenticeship scheme folks it's a it's almost like a graduate scheme isn't it exactly they they do uh, they do specialist training on on four to five machines uh, and that really gives them the breadth and, and depth of uh, a machine uh, training that they need to go and work on big projects like hs2 but we also get them to to go around and understand other parts of the business like the hire desk like the transport and logistics side of the business so it's, it's a rounded apprenticeship uh, uh, scheme and as you say, Peter, very much like a graduate scheme, and that's how we sort of view it. And you're getting a deep dive here into the Flannery business, but you're also getting a deep dive with partners uh, that are like Farge, Kia, uh, Favolia and BAM joint venture that are going to be putting people through that. And what's interesting is you've actually had those apprenticeships talking to that business as well. Haven't you? Yeah, they went on a, a pre-apprenticeship programme just for three, uh, three days. It was a, an online training programme. But they gave them a bit of an insight into the industry and about what some of our clients uh, want from, uh, uh, from the supply chain and the workforce. So it was really helpful for them to meet some of our clients, actually, yeah. And those are some big clients here doing some big projects. This is a big depot for HS2. There's all sorts of things still being dug so that you can lay out all the training areas because it's practical training. There's simulators downstairs, training rooms here. But you've got a whole area that's in front of me now. It looks like one of Flannery's construction sites at the moment, but it is actually going to be Flannery's operator training area, isn't it? Yeah, and they, and they focus in the Trailblazer. You mentioned they, they do the practical training on the machines, they do theory training, uh, but the standard is built around 15 core duties and the knowledge, skills and behaviours you need to learn to be an excellent operator. And that's what we want from our uh, uh, apprenticeship Trailblazer scheme, that we have well-rounded, excellent, uh, highly safe operators at the end of it. And this is great for me to see because what we're doing, Paul, is we are giving people a career, but we're giving people a qualification, a recognised standard. And that is going to help these individuals progress within Flannery or uh, elsewhere in the industry and ultimately give back to the industry. And we need thousands more people to come into this industry, don't we, Paul? Completely. There's a, still a huge shortage of operators in the industry and this is just one, one of the solutions that ensures that people have a passport to have a long-term career and sustainable career in plant. And we're, you know, we're just so excited that this is the start, we're, but th th there's a lot more that's going to happen and we're going to really try and fill that gap. Yeah, and boy, oh boy, Mark, it's an absolutely fantastic place. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a real game changer and it's, it's, right there at the heart of what's going on as well you know and there is a partnership there between Flannery and Balfour Beatty so you know it's got tier one contractors and it's got um the plant hires uh, in there as well this is great yeah absolutely I mean that that really is quite a commitment I, I, I guess when you've got projects like HS2 on your doorstep you can afford to commit to that level but I, I mean, aside from the fact that obviously they're looking to take commercial advantage of HS2, that just, just shows an enormous commitment to the industry, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know what, Mark? Um, I this, the, this afternoon, I put up a, a video interview with a woman called Jessica who decided to stop training to uh, go into the police force. I said, chuck her handcuffs away and come and be the first female trailblazer for that Flannery apprenticeship, which was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, and to me, that is a real statement of intent, you know, that fundamentally she thought, actually, there's a better career opportunity. It's more interesting for me. Gave up another, uh, you know, proper career opportunity to come and do that. And there's Cullen, who, uh, interesting story with Cullen. He's basically got all his tickets, couldn't get a job, but that saw and grew up with Flannery. And then basically what's happened with him is he come onto the Trailblazer scheme and he's already gone, right, what I want to do is I'll end up wanting to be a mentor and a trainer myself because he's seen how difficult it is for other people to actually get into the industry. And and, and that's wrong uh, that it's difficult to get into the industry, but great to see someone like that, age 29, coming into that Trailblazer scheme. It's like a graduate scheme and just going, right, here I go, off we go, you know? Totally. Um, interestingly, our next interview um, kind of follows that very, uh, very similar path. Um, 
one of the things I wanted to point out in tonight's show was the fact that the opportunities afforded by this industry don't just end at work boots and hard hats. And uh, as we're about to find out, in fact, if you play your cards right, you work hard and you make a name for yourself, you might just end up having lunch with the Queen. Here we go. Katie Kelleher is a force of nature, a one-woman phenomenon. She's presented an impossible engineering segment on steam shovels. She's been a guest on BBC's Woman's Hour. She was named as one of the top voices on the LinkedIn social media platform. And she was invited to the Queen's Garden Party. And yet six years ago, Katie Kelleher was an apprentice crane operator. Today, she's a vocal advocate for women in construction and more specifically for apprenticeships within the construction sector. But as she explains, her own apprenticeship didn't really get off to a flying start. Now, I turned up and I said, oh, I'm here for the induction. And this guy just went yeah, yeah, upstairs. So I walked upstairs and there was this guy at the front of the room talking to a room full of other guys. And I, I walked in and everyone stared at me. They just stared at me and I, I, they stopped talking and they stared. And it was at that point that I questioned my decisions in life and what, were, what was I actually doing? So I thought, I said, Katie, what the hell are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself through this? And I kept walking through the room because I didn't know I wasn't in the right place. I thought I was in the right place because that's where I was sent. So I walked through the room. Everyone looked at me. They eventually sighed talking again. I stood at the back wall, slid down the wall, sat on the floor and stayed there until everyone left because I didn't know what else to do. So how did you come to the construction industry? So I, I went to university. I went through various shitty sales jobs. I sold cars. I sold advertising space. Then eventually I fell into recruitment um, and I worked on a trades and labour desk. And I guess this is where my interest in construction started. People often think that I walked around London many times looking up at the skies and thinking, oh, I really want to be a crane operator. That's everything I aspire to be. And in general, it doesn't happen like that. My dad was a bricklayer, um, site foreman, fifth generation bricklayer, always worked in construction, but I never, ever thought it was something that would be open to me. I just really needed a change. I was in a real shit point in my life. Um, you know, my finances had gone to shit everything and it kind of just come to me one day and I thought could I work in construction okay I had no qualifications absolutely no qualifications I had no idea of anything that I would do in construction but I just thought would there be a possibility what if I send out a few CVs and see whether anyone might offer me a position doing something in construction how did you hear about the opportunity I was driving home from work one day and I got this phone call and they said, uh, we got your CV, but we've got a new apprenticeship starting, a lifting technician apprenticeship. Uh, how do you feel about being a crane operator? I said, email it over. I'll have a little look through and um, I'll get back in contact with you. And I never, ever, ever once thought about being a crane operator. I didn't know I could operate a crane. I didn't know if I'd be anything, any good at it. I didn't know what it really involved, um, what training to be a crane operator really involved. But I thought I'd go to the interview. And I turned up at the interview. And there was all these men. It was all men. And I've got like my little dress on because I've just skived out of work for a little bit and little shoes. And they're all suited and booted as well. But I just remember walking in. And I was like, oh, my God, like, why am I here? And you do when you can't even relate to the people you're looking at. You just think, why are you here? Like, they're not going to even look at you. Why, why would they even offer you a job? Obviously, construction remains a very male dominated industry. And yet you fought very hard to retain your femininity. And I think you've got to do that. I think, you know, with any job, you can't give up everything you are and give up who you are just to conform to what you think you should be or what the status quo on site is. You have to just be yourself. Just turn up and be yourself, you know. And funny enough, I think construction is one of them areas where you can be yourself. And people are maybe a little bit more accepting of different people. I mean, we I, I, I've never worked in an industry where I'm at such a diverse population of people. What did your apprenticeship do for you? Honestly, the apprenticeship is the best thing I've ever done in my life. It was the one good decision uh, that changed everything. It changed how I felt. It changed my mental health. It changed um, my work life, it just, it picked everything up. Imagine that somebody actually pays you to go and learn a whole new skill base, something you never, ever, ever dreamt that you could do or be any good at. 
and somebody's paying you for the possibility to do that. I just think I, I'm I think apprenticeships are amazing, and it is a pivotal point in my life where everything did change for the better. So six years on, and after all you've accomplished and all you've achieved, would you now recommend an apprenticeship to a young person starting out, or more specifically for a young woman? Yes, I would completely, and I think. Um, apprenticeships in construction are great because you know you can be a late comer to an apprenticeship as me apprenticeships aren't just for people who fall out of school who you know looking for a new start to do something different I could be a career changer I could you know I did about 10 years of sales before I I even thought about doing something like this and I think that's that's where construction is really strong um they're really willing to train you up and they want you to do well nobody gives you an apprenticeship and sets you up to fail. You were given her an apprenticeship because they want you to do well. They really want you to succeed in everything you do. My goodness me, Mark, you know, what a, a massive, a massively insightful there. You know, I think uh, that's what I'm hearing from people. Yeah. I've 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 literally spoken to loads of apprentices over the last week, two weeks, and they're coming from different areas, and they like that. I, I spoke to Chloe, who is coming on the show. She's a hairdresser that decided not for me and came into the industry. There's other people that just fallen into the industry. It's like Katie says, we're kind of like that big bucket that ca catches the right, right minded people. And I think that's really important because you have to have the right go get them, get up really early in the morning, work really hard uh, attitude. And if you've got that, you can have a proper career and a career that gives you a lot of satisfaction, like Katie said, a sense of belonging, but also hard cash, Mark, you know, and therefore uh, that's, you know, you can you can have the, the nicer things in life and you can keep uh, working and you can move around and People like Katie that get skilled, they could go anywhere in the world. Totally. I'm, I'm glad that you said nice things about Katie because I know I can see her actually in the comments section there. So uh, I, I'm I, I didn't pay him to say that, Katie. We're, we're, I know. You know, I, I, you're, you're a mate of mine, Katie, but I, I, I do think you're a real inspiration, which is something that uh, somebody else has said here. Alexander Andrews, uh, loving these honest interviews. I'll, I would have normally put these um, comments on the screen, but for some reason that part of the system is, is currently freaking out. And I can see um, we've got Alex Andrews in the, uh, in the comments there. We've got Katie, as I've already said. Jackie Cuthbert is watching. Katie is such a great role model for girls and women in our industry. Absolutely spot on, Jackie. Um, uh, who else have we got? Conrad. Good evening, Conrad. Great to see you here again. Uh, Justin Carrigan's here. Hey, for some hey, reason, he's saying going? good evening, Peter. Oh, hey, hey, we've got that thing, Mark. You know, oh, a, my what? super fans, not yours. Mine. Yeah. mine. <laughs> just, just a poor show. Uh, Peter Ferguson, who is here as often as I am, uh, he's put up a comment as well, saying that he's actually been through an apprenticeship as well. Sean Gratton, uh, Sean Everpresent, Malcolm Dykes here, Ken Hatcher's here. Uh, no prizes tonight, Ken, so um, <laughs> I, whether you want to stick around remains to be seen, but that, it's all, all good stuff. What are you stuff. talking about, Mark? We've got stickers. Stickers. We have got stickers. And, well, we know how Ken likes a sticker. <laughs> now, getting back to the, the real... Um, Good evening, Justin. Thank you. Delated, <laughs> but I'll, I'll let it go. Now, obviously, we do find ourselves in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. Um, and there's a lot of industry sectors that are currently in lockdown or on furlough. But as those in construction are considered key workers, not only in, is the industry still firing on all cylinders, it's actively recruiting as well. And as, as an example, I think if we head on over to, um, Peter, your friends at Sunbelt Rental, because they are going all guns blazing in the recruitment field. I'm going to play this and I'll let you tell me more about it afterwards. Right. Hi, I'm Peter Haddock I'm in Smethwick. And guess what? I'm here at the Sunbelt Rentals, one of their depots in the area. And I've got Jackie Cuthbert, head of social impact here at uh, Sunbelt Rentals. Jackie, what a great title that is. And the reason I've dragged you out today is because we're talking jobs, 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 jobs. You told me when we're prepping for an interview with one of your apprentices that you've got lots of jobs. Tell me about it really quickly. Yeah, we've got about 50 jobs at the moment for apprentices. We're taking applications for roles right across the country, from Scotland right down to the southwest. There are a variety of roles. We've got the drivers, the engineers, 
We've got customer service, kind of higher controller roles, working with our customers. Uh, yeah, and they're for anybody at all. So whether you've got any experience or no experience from any type of background, we're really keen to hear from you. So just get yourself over to careers.sunbeltrentals.co.uk. So folks, careers.sunbeltrentals.co.uk, but Jackie, some of those roles are ideal for people that have just unfortunately lost their jobs in retail. Those customer service people, they're really needed in this industry, aren't they? And those engineering jobs, we're gonna to talk to one of your engineers very shortly, and that engineer has gone from apprenticeship to career to management in no time at all. And he's looking after this depot. Jackie, that's a career, isn't it? That's the social impact, isn't it? It is. I, I really understand what your job's about now, Jackie. Thanks for coming, folks. Remember, careers at Sunbelt Rentals and basically the job's there right now. And that's right, Mark. And, you know, great, great opportunities there with Sunbelt. They're expanding. And if you, for the listeners out there, these are the people that have set up COVID testing centres in 12 hours. Recently, they've had teams out there in minus degrees overnight setting up more testing facilities to protect us all and get out there. There's people that have put themselves um, out there for everybody else, and they've got a full range of business. They're not just a plant as, you know, they're a merger of 20-odd businesses, and there's just so many different opportunities there. And, you know, they're doing apprenticeships as well. And tomorrow on my channels, Mark, content with media channels, but me, Peter Haddock on LinkedIn, I'm putting out um, a very insightful uh, podcast. Uh, it's not a podcast. It's a video. A very insightful video, sorry, um, from Dan, one of their team members, um, who literally did go from apprenticeship. Within six months, he's uh, in a management role out of coming out of that. That says that these people are investing in people. They've got a Cheshire College that they've got a proper relationship with. And, and really, they are saying to people, we want you to come into the industry and they're helping on all different fronts, people from various different backgrounds, even people with ex-armed forces, etc. I can't say enough about this, but there are jobs there. Go for it. Absolutely. Um, I just want to say uh, uh, we've got a, a long comment. I'm going to save this one from Sean because it is a bit long. Um, good evening, Craig. Good evening, Joe Vendetti. Joe's watching all the way from the States, so it's good to see that we've got uh, our international audience, even if it, as far as I can see, it's just the one person, but that's great to see. Now, Obviously, you've just interviewed Jackie, and I, I was with uh, with Katie as well, and and it's great to see the ladies in the industry as well. But sadly, I think there is still a gender imbalance within the industry. And over the years, I've listened to a lot of people attempting to explain precisely why we've got a skill shortage, and yet we continue to play pay lip service to around fifty one percent of the entire population. And I've been told variously that this is down to the industry's macho reputation that women can't lift stuff, <laughs> that, there's, that there's a lack of suitable role models and that women are just not aware of the opportunities available. And then last night, I was on the Clubhouse app, which is where I seem to be spending an inordinate amount of my time at the moment, and I heard a guy called Matt Dunleavy talking, and he made more sense in about five seconds than the industry training boards and all the working parties combined. So bit unscripted, a bit unplanned. I've invited Matt onto the show. Um, let's see if his connection's working. He's here. He's here, Mark. He's here. Good evening, Matt. How are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. Fantastic. Now, you? you run a – I'm going to let you tell your story, but you run a construction company in the Midlands. You're clearly very engaged on social media. As I say, we, you and I met on Clubhouse, but you've got 80,000 odd followers on TikTok. You're a loyal following over on Instagram. But the reason you're here is that I think you've got a unique perspective on why so few young girls choose to pursue a career in construction. And that reason can be summed up in one word, parenting. Matt, what was the point that you made on Clubhouse so eloquently last night? So I heard a lot of chats really about why women aren't coming into construction and what could be done to increase that. Now, I firmly believe the biggest influence on children are the parents. And I've got three girls. And as a builder, I actively try and teach them and upskill them and knowledge them of, of construction and every aspect of it. And at least give them the option, educate them to know that it's, it's a viable career choice. Now, generally, you know, boys follow their fathers, girls follow their mothers. And it's kind of a, a generational stereotype that 
girls don't do construction. Whereas if they're educated properly and they're told, you know, a, a prime example, I said to my mother, uh, when I was younger, she encouraged me to get into a trade, have a trade, you'll always have work. And my sister, and she, she gave her opposite advice. Oh, I want you to go to do law, I want you to do something else. And I kind of said, how, how did we differ in advice? I don't know, I just didn't want her to, to you know, have to do all that hard work. Now, if she was educated properly on how many areas of construction there are and how, you know, prestigious it can be and the money involved and, and if you work hard and you, you're good at what you do, anybody can do it. I just think it's parents educating their children as to all the areas of construction and that they have to be made. So I tell all my children the same, the boys and the girls, they both get the same options, they both get the same skill set, they both get the same you know, influence from me and I'll let them choose what they want to do. But a lot of parents don't do that. I spoke to some of my friends who, I want my boy to be a footballer, I want him to do this, I want my girl to be a hairdresser, like a mother or something like that. But if, they, if they're taught early that it's an option, and they've shown every aspect of construction, then maybe they might like it and they may want to do that. And it's maybe more acceptable to themselves rather than follow the stereotype. I think that's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely spot on. I, what would be interesting, I mean, we, we've got an audience now. I'm not entirely sure how many people we've got across the, the various platforms, but we, we've got an audience here of construction people who have lived and breathed construction. Given the, that most of you are in the construction industry, I'd be intrigued to know just how much you would encourage a daughter or a granddaughter or a niece into the sector. So using the comment section below, put a yes if you would encourage a, a, a female into the industry or a no if you wouldn't. Just be intrigued to, to know where you all stand. I, I do apologise for throwing you in, in at the deep end like that, Matt, but I'm, I'm really delighted you could join us. One final point, unless Peter's got any points, where can people find you online? I've already mentioned your uh, your social media presence, but where can people find you? So I'm on Instagram, D5 Construction. Uh, and you know what? That's another point. I, I, I posted a picture of my kids doing work on there and laying bricks. And I've had so many comments saying, did they actually like it? Because, you know, they look like they're having fun. And they did. They had fun. But my point is, I'm giving them the option. But I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on uh, TikTok. And I'm also now on Clubhouse, which is quite a good platform. So contact me. Follow me. Follow me. Sorry, the one thing I didn't get, one thing I wanted to say, Matt, is I've got a son who's coming on the show later on. Why don't we see if your daughter can build a brick wall faster than him? Because oh, that oh. is a position right there. Because oh, I have to do that. So, game on. I'll tell you what, let's do the whole thing. Let's get them to give them a time frame, give them the materials. They've got to load it out, get it ready, and build it. Yeah, yeah. Or we could go collaboratively and get and build it together. But you, one way or the other, let's you two are just looking to get something built free of charge, aren't you? I can see what's going on. Here. <laughs> let's, make, let's make it happen. These are young people that are going to go. Hey, it's you know, it's great. When I was a kid, I built a wall, you know, for a sun lounge um, that we'd had at the ha uh, our house, you know, and I was carrying brick by brick when I was about three, four years old, you know. And, but that's just the attitude. But look, I'd love to get those sort of uh, people together. So let's let's sort that out, Matt, when we can get back together. And yeah. uh, I'm sure somebody on here will give us a space to do that. Um, uh, I'm sure there's a few businesses that would jump all over us for that, Matt, I reckon. Well, Fingers crossed. You know, contact us. Contact us through there. Good job. Fantastic. Well, Matt, as you've got five kids, I'm sure you've got dinner to go and prepare. So I'm going to let you get back to the... The, the other part of your day job. Um, but I really appreciate you being here tonight. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, I've pressed the wrong button. That's me. I'm back. <laughs> uh, no, he's not. <laughs> there, there you go. So many buttons and such a pillock driving. Um, <laughs> You, you'll not be surprised to learn that everybody, literally 100% of the people that commented said you know, that yes, they would encourage a daughter, granddaughter or a niece into the industry, which is great to see. Um, a few more hellos to say. Good evening, Callum, uh, and thank you for the hat. I hope you saw it in the Katie interview, but it might be coming up again a bit later. Um, uh, where's, my hat? where's my hat? Mark, you can't bring hats on your own. Peter, it's it's like the check. It's in the post. Don't you worry about it. Yes. Um,
we've had a, a comment from Trackless, who I'm going to take a wild stab at and say probably a, a lady in the industry, which is great to see. Uh, Craig Jenkins, good evening. Good evening, John. Good evening, Malcolm, if I haven't already said that. Um, yeah, so some good feedback there. Now, sticking with the uh, the feminine theme, Peter, you've spoken to a young lady who, and I think you've already alluded to this, who is also forging her own path yeah. here in the construction industry. Yes, you know, and that's Christina. And Christina basically is one of those people, she's very, very got the same kind of attitude as Katie. And, you know, for me, I was absolutely delighted to see that she put out a positive post there. She's actually a truck driver, was a bus driver, a truck driver. And now she's actually training to be a 360 operator. And she put a positive post out there, Mark. I jumped on that and um, and gave her the opportunity to come onto the show. And I've also done a podcast with her. Because I was just so impressed. We just need people like Katie and Christina. Um, she hit a million views of that post on LinkedIn. And I've got to say, I'm delighted for her. And therefore, got her on the show, managed to contact her. And like I say, there is a podcast coming out next week. which has got a bit more information on. And again, just like some of the apprentices, I've spoken to. I've promised her that I'm going to follow her progress and support her as she moves forward because we need people like her to be talking out there. We need people like her that are actually doing the job uh, to send the message out. So enough about me. Let's talk to Christina. For the next guest, folks, we've got Christina Dimitriou and this is the power of social media and this is the power of career opportunities, folks, and what this skill show is all about. She went on to social media with a hugely positive message a million people later and she's got the job offers. Christina, welcome on the show. Tell us all about it. Why you Kate, want to come into the industry and how you went out there and just fought for that job position. Hey, Peter, thanks for having me. So um, the, the 360 operator came as a bit of a out there comment. I took a photo when I went on site one day. I was like, oh, I would love to drive a digger. And somebody popped up on LinkedIn and said, we're going to give you that opportunity to do that. And I'm, I'm now doing that. And I just want to empower more women to be able to do these jobs because they're not easy. They're never going to be easy. But if more people support that, we're going to have more women being able to come forward and feel comfortable doing the uncomfortable. And what's great about that is this is social media. So this industry is yeah, got it's great. and uh, use social media, a better way to engage with young people like yourself. So what's going yeah. to happen next, Christina? And, and, and where are you now? And, and when will we see you on a site digging? So I'm hoping just to do my test um, at the end of the month. And then once I've got my ticket, I've had a few opportunities of people saying to me, do you want to come over? But I'm hoping to get someone that's going to know that I'm um, I'm new. They're going to have patience. They're going to be supportive and they're going to want me to get the best experience from being a 360 operator. And your story is great because you've come from a background. You're driving instructor, buses. So after the buses, I went on to trucks and I was driving a, um, a mounted truck, 26 ton and with a high ab on the back. And I was delivering building materials and then just slowly gone over to the 360. It's just like I've just gone bigger and bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. That's fantastic. So listen, your message to everybody today, it's a skills thing, it's a careers thing, your message to everybody out there, in particular young people um, and everybody from different backgrounds, why they should come into the industry and, and what to do. If, if, if this sort of work is something that you love and you're passionate about, never allow anybody to make you doubt doing the job that you love or doubt trying to do the job that you love. Set yourself a goal and make sure you do not lose sight of it ever. And that's right. And that's why you are on the live show. Positivity from Christina there. We're going to have to say goodbye, Christina. But guess what? Christina's on my podcast and she's talking a little bit in depth about that. But we're not going to give too much away because she'll be back on another edition in six months time. And we'll be hearing more from you in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And there you go, Mark. You know, what an absolute inspiration that is. And just real people, really passionate. 
I just want to do that. But uh, guys, I don't know if you noticed there's the business that actually offered her training there that was in that LinkedIn, Doctore. I uh, can't remember the full name at the moment. Um, they have given her that training for free because they recognize that actually they've got an opportunity to help her come into the industry. Outstanding, outstanding. And I'm not saying, you know, they've got a business to run, they need to make money, but they've slotted her in, in between sessions when there's free time. And, you know, hands up to people like that. That's what we need. That will come back to them in in bucket loads, Mark, um, when they've got the right kind of attitude, you know? If, if you'll pardon the pun. One of the things that strikes me tonight, and, and we honestly, we really haven't handpicked these people, but when you look at, at Jackie, at Katie and at Christina, you know, they are properly feminine, properly empowered and properly passionate about this industry. That is exactly what we need, isn't it? Yeah, and you know what? They're nice people, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> end of the day, end of the day, they're really nice people. I tell you what, I had a laugh with all of the people that I've interviewed from the show. You know, and and it's like you know, me and Jackie had a really good laugh, and she jumped into the opportunity to talk about the jobs. When I said, "Come on, get your hard hat on, we're going out," and it's without a quibble, she was there. You know, Christina, what I got in touch, she was like, "Yes, no problem." She even apologised. For getting back to me late because she was trying to to message the over nine hundred people or more that had messaged her, and she's apologising to me, you know. To, and I'm like, don't worry about it; it's fine, you know. But she wanted to get back to every single one of them. That's just humans. That's polite people. That's people that understand that somebody has made the effort to make that comment. I'm going to try and go back, you know, and stressing out because you, you've got so many to get through. But just that those kind of people deserve to have opportunities. Responding to social media comments is something that a few corporate brands could learn from, as uh, as I've been waffling on about quite a lot recently. Now, <laughs> we do, ladies and gents, we do have a lot to come yet. Um, but I am conscious of the fact that we haven't had many diggers on the show yet, <laughs> and I'm also mindful of the fact that Peter and I are out here like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and I'll leave you to decide which is which. But we're gra <laughs> he's Jagger. Um, we're glad grabbing all the glory while the talent is sat quietly in the background keeping the beat for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to get our main man, Nick Drew, on the show. Uh, he is the Charlie Watts of the Construction Collective, and it's about time we gave him a thumbs up, thumbs up that he deserves. Oh. Nick, do your thing. Hi, it's Nick Drew. You join me here today at Pra Sands, where I'm on a, a development where they're doing holiday cottages and, or caravan bases, isn't it? Yeah, caravan bases. And yeah. Uh, obviously, as tonight, uh, the show is about um, attracting young people in the industry. I've been joined by young Harry McKay, who's a, a real keen, enthusiastic young operator. Um, tell me, Harry, how did you get into this game in the first place? Well, it's probably back long when I started going college, to be honest. I was just looking around and always kind of sparked my eye, really, driving machines and that. Um, so, yeah, I went into college for well, it was about six months, I think it was. Um, and, yeah, really enjoyed it. Love yeah. doing it still now. So, yeah. where, where did you actually go for college? Dutchy College. In oh, Stoke Dutchy, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was the best place I seemed to find. And Yeah. Yeah, they were helpful. And, yeah. yeah. You went on for Tony Wagner, I believe. And, and how, how did that work out? Well, I was in college. It all kind of went a bit parasite with one of the teachers and when they got someone else and it wasn't quite the same so I was kind of like well I would like to go out and learn it on the ground to be honest now yeah. and so Tony was the first person I asked and with age and that it was a bit difficult to sort someone out but luckily in the end and thank you to him yeah yeah, yeah it's given yeah. me opportunity to be where I am today to be honest yeah well that's the nice thing isn't it I mean yeah. Tony's a young guy who's made a real success of his business yeah, yeah. and uh, I think you know he appreciates that and he's tried to bring young people in and uh, yeah yeah definitely yeah also our old friend uh, Graham Santini has been something of a mentor to you I yeah, believe yeah, and that's... yeah he's been a massive help to be honest yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely give me some guidance and yeah Show me a few things of his machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a big thank you to him as well, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, in life we all need a, a mentor of some description and uh, 
uh, obviously yeah. he's really been a good one for you, so that's great. Yeah, he has, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, what would your advice be for for any young people looking to come into this industry? Definitely give it a go if you yeah. if you're interested in it. And yeah, definitely, hundred percent. I think it's like you said, something more people need to get into now, yeah. and especially younger generation. Um, yeah, like you say, I've yeah. enjoyed it ever since. Yeah. So. Yeah. If they want to do it, go for it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, there you go, folks. That's uh, Harry McKay. How old are you, Harry, by the way? 19. 19. 19-year-old 19 Harry McKay. Living the dream here, driving this nice uh, Zaxxis 130 LCN and uh, in the glorious surroundings of Pra Sands. What more could you want? Exactly. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, Harry. That's all right. Cheers. Yeah, and you know what? What a lovely, lovely interview that was because it's two people. Nick is the operator. He knows the area. He knows his boss. He knows the mentor, uh, you know, and that's Nick. That's what Nick does. He's all over the place, but in particular in Cornwall, you know, that's where his, his area that he lives. He just knows people, and that's why he is the Digger Man blogger. That's why he is the person we go to because he's the operator that knows how to, he knows how expensive that machine is. That is a really high end spec machine. 19 year old is being given that machine. That is really trusting. And you know, and what they were saying earlier about age, you know, the, the owner of the business is young. So he's basically saying, oh, I'm not too sure because he's young himself and you know, he's trying to build his business. He has recognized that he needs to give somebody an opportunity, right attitude, right opportunity, mentor. This is the big word, the big M word, Mark, mentor. If you can put people with skills together with people coming into the industry, you've got a winner. You can't just train people on uh, simulators and things like that. You, you need to have the fundamentals of how to dig, how to operate a machine, how to use a joystick, how to actually clean and look after your machine, how to do your daily checks, all these sorts of things. And understand that if something goes wrong, we've got you covered. Yeah, and that's uh, totally, totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Peter, yeah, you are my mentor, <laughs> uh, as as you well know. Uh, but we, whenever you and I talk about skills within the construction, particularly in the plant sector, we always talk about technology and how, how this could be embraced by the people of the PlayStation generation. And I'll apologise to Lucas for describing him like that when, when he comes on the show. But we are about to see a couple of bits that really play to that ethos. But first, let's take a look at some of that technology in action. Yeah, and you know what, Mark? This is exciting because you know my you know my space technology, PlayStation, GPS machine control, electrification, hydrogen, all of that sort of stuff is like ooh, super uber exciting for me. And the guys at SMT GB and Volvo uh, Construction have asked me to host their customer and uh, launch event for two electric machines, an excavator, and a wheel loader next week on the 16th of February, and basically, I'm super excited about it, because this is great, because I get to go and ask the right questions. I get to go and say, look, this is what the industry wants to go. I've asked, you know, people from Flannery and Lynch already, what are the questions you want me to ask the experts? So we can get in, this is what we're doing here. We're trying to get people to, like Sean Grattan did the other day when on one of our lives, asked an amazing question. I wouldn't have had a clue, didn't even know how to read the question, you know, but that's where I'm getting to. That's where I'm at. And so to be able to host these kind of things and be able to put a bit of passion into it like we're doing now, and also to be able to understand the journey that Volvo are going on. I mean, it might, it's not a secret, I don't think, but you know, you've got to come on to it to understand there's a big statement from Volvo globally about electrification. And there's some new exciting stuff about hydrogen. I can't give it away. Sworn to secrecy. Got to go to the webinar. But uh, check out my LinkedIn and whatever. I'd just go to SMTGB's website or social media. All of the details are there. Um, February the 16th. I'm excited. I'm electric, Mark. 
Yeah, I, I can't help but notice that, that Justin Carrigan said hello to you, and SMT GB have invited you to do the presentation of their. their yeah, I'm just here you know to what? press the buttons, aren't I? You know what, Mark? I I have never been to JCB. You've written a book on them. You know yeah, that is true, and I do have uh, a Furukawa hat here that you haven't got, so it's not all bad. Yeah, well, you know what? We're, we we we'll bat off each other. You've got your friends, I've got mine. <laughs> <laughs> but what's yeah, been, I, in all honesty, what's been great though with SNTGB is they've recognised you know, the the reach that you and Nick have got, and you know, working together as a three, we're collaborating to try and push the message out for SNTGB about that event, and also uh, the materials that are going to come out after that event. So. Thanks very much to SNTGB for supporting us as a group so that we can support them as a group. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Just get the message out there in the right way. Totally agree. We've had lots of more comments uh, come in, uh, including that one from Nick Johnson. Um, build on early Bob the Builder interest. I totally agree with that, Nick. Absolutely. I, unfortunately, we, we do tend to go through a bit of a lull, I think, with the young people. It's Bob the Builder, nothing. You need a job. It's that nothing that we need to fill in, isn't it? You know, it, re it really is. Excavator in, the, in that nothing, you need the excavator to remove all the clothes, junk, empty, uh, empty canisters from the rooms, Mark. You know, uh, so, or the waste recycling unit. You know. Now, what what other people can't see is the fact that Lucas is in the green room and he's sat there chuckling to himself right now because he's clearly heard all of this before. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get to him, and we will get to him very very soon. Um, We've mentioned technology, um, and we're going to do it again. Um, you've been speaking to our resident equipment uh, technology expert, uh, Mr. Hawkins. Um, what's all that about? Well, you know, this is about skills and careers, Mark. What is the big problem? Uh, you know, and I'm not going to get into the debate on this show, but um, cards, uh, operator skills, differentiation, uh, qualification, and we've got to, well, like the Flannery Trailblazer scheme, We've got to professionalize this industry to give the people that deserve it that real qualification that they can go wallop. There you are. I have got this level of qualification and skill set. It's being assessed, and I'm that person for you, you know? And so that's what Dale is talking about. He's, he's been working tirelessly uh, in a collaboration with Western College as well for some time. I've reported on that for a, a while now. Uh, BTEC. Uh, is what we're talking. So let's talk it. For my next slot, I have got our resident operator and digital expert and trading guru, Dale Hawkins. Dale, you've come on today because we've got something super important to talk about. We're about careers and skills today. Wow, wow. We've got a BTEC level two diploma in my favorite subject, GPS machine control. It's live. What's happening? Tell us all about it. How can people get on it? Why have you done it? And also, what does it mean for a career? Because this is a proper qualification, isn't it? It's not just something that's popped up overnight. We've been working on this now for probably two years. So first of all, recognizing the reasons why we've had to come up with, with a nationally recognized qualification for operators is one of the things that we've learned while we've been training on machine control is it's not something that you can train in a day. Um, GPS machine control is such a vast subject and to upskill operators to learn how to be confident and efficient with GPS machine control is such a hard thing. You're not just asking operators to follow a sat nav in a car, you're asking them to embrace high tech, highly advanced engineering tools and also what they get at the end of it um you know these guys are going to be walking away with with an internationally recognized qualification so dale how can we get people into the btec how can they get involved uh what do they have to do where can they go right uh, so we're planning to roll out in march uh nationwide the qualification is generally going to be a be possible to be delivered by anybody as long as they meet our centre uh, requirements and obviously with it being di a, a diploma it has to be regulated um, so that's one of the key things at the moment is getting um, suppliers on board to deliver the qualification and also um, meet the requirements just to go in a, into a bit about it, it it's part of a few month process first of all they embark on a e-learning program then they come in for training and then the rest of it is this is where the key to it is is it's vocational so it's on-site learning operators are uh, 
issued with a portfolio which has got certain tasks and we've had to uh, tailor the course to be relevant on all different types of machine control so it's um it's not just one brand specific um so obviously these drivers then start to learn as they go through their working day and as long as they produce their uh, portfolios with the tasks that have been met or whether they come into the college at that point they're independently assessed by a, a independent verifier which verifies it and yeah they can do it all whilst they're working which is again minimizing downtime and it's giving um experienced operators something to work towards and new newcomers something to work towards it's 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 actually becoming a really big success dale that's fantastic and you're working with western college already um and delivering this like you said it's going to be rolling out nationally folks if you need to know more information where can they go dale they can just drop us an email. They can contact Western College. Um, they can go through a Facebook page. Dale, another great moment from you, our digital operator expert champion in the UK. Thanks very much for coming on. No problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, and look, that's a big move. <laughs> you know, two big moves in this show. We've broken two big, big things that are happening in this show right now for operators. The it, This is going to snowball, Mark. The opportunities are huge. The projects are huge. The money that is going to be spent this year on kit is hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. No good spending all that money if you can't have anybody to operate it, Mark, is there? No, i absolutely right. You know, because obviously you you filmed the bit with with uh, with Dale and, and with the, the folks at Flannery. One of the things that strikes me, having seen those for the first time, is just the level of commitment that some of these companies are putting into the industry. I, we, we tend to get to the end of the year and we look back and, you know, we hand out awards of achievement that are generally financially based. But what Flannery and Plant Force are putting in place now will have a positive impact on the industry in a year, 10 years, possibly 20 years' time. That really does need recognising, and I, I'm, I'm so pleased that we can actually shine a light on those people. Well, that's why I said it, Mark. You know, when we when we decided last year that we were going to do these regular live shows once a month, um, you know, we, we changed the pilot to, to support the Lighthouse Club charity. That was the right thing to do uh, because they, they'd lost nearly a quarter of a million pounds because of their event, uh, Christmas event. Uh, and now we come through and, you know, really, really – we have to put people together with people to make this industry successful. And if we can do that in the tiniest way from tonight's show, from talking to other people, from sharing this around, from getting all the people that are listening to share around, then if we can get one person, just one, to just think, hold on a minute, I'm going to look into that. Right? I hope that person is Carl, who is on the screen at the moment there. <laughs> That's what we want. You know, <laughs> Carl... Carl, if there's anything that, that Peter and I can do to, to make that happen, count yeah. us in. We yeah. would love to see you being one of the first. We really would. No, no, get, get in touch, Carl. Uh, you know, for me, that is the one comment I wanted to have on this show. Tick box. Thank you. Move on. Our work here is done. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, Peter, between Jackie, Katie, Christina, and probably some others that I forgot about. I think we've, we've shown a fair degree of, of gender diversity on the show tonight. Yeah. But I'm very conscious of the need to show some age diversity too. Um, we've got two segments coming up that show both ends of the age spectrum. In a second, I'm going to be speaking to a man who changed career at the eight, ripe old age of 40, uh, thanks to an apprenticeship with the uh, building materials supplier, Breeden. But first, something a little bit different. Uh, I'm a firm believer that you do need to practice what you preach, and I'm also aware that no self-respecting young person really wants to watch a pair of old farts like us wax lyrical about career opportunities. And we wanted a young person. And I'm delighted to say that we found one, and thankfully we didn't have too far to look for him either. And now I always thought that Haddock co-presenters came in double XL size, but it turns out they're also available in junior sizes as well. So let's get... I think he's 13. Let's get Lucas Haddock on the show. Um, and when I do, I'm going to take his dad out so that he can't influence what he's saying. <laughs> Good evening, Lucas. Good evening, Mark. Um, I am delighted to take this opportunity to thank Richie Brothers for getting me here today. That's fantastic. Uh, you, you've already got your father's knack for mentioning the right sponsors. So that's, that's a good start. Um, 
you, you also look better lit than he does as well. And you're quieter, right? I might actually make this a permanent feature, actually. Uh, now, you've been speaking to another young person about her career switch. So given the fact that you've done that, would you like to uh, introduce your film? Um, well, I have interviewed Chloe about her career switch from hairdressing to going into the cab. In that case, I'm going to roll the film and we'll find out more right now. Today I'm here with Chloe Rackley, who got the highly commended Plant Operator of the Year Award in 2020. How did you feel when you got this award? Um, I was quite shocked, really. I didn't expect to be nominated at all for it. Um, and then obviously when I found out I was, I was thrilled that I'd even been nominated for it and to get highly commended was just amazing to show like if you put effort and work and passion into something, then other people will notice it. Okay, that sounds brilliant. And you had a really big career switch from being a hairdresser to becoming a plant operator in only a short amount of time. What do you say to other people who must be nervous about trying to have a career switch into the plant operating industry? Um, I always say if you've got nothing to lose, um, give the industry a try and you can get so much out of it. It's got so much to offer for anyone wanting to join. Okay, and what is the favourite plant that you've been in when you've been with Lynch Plant Hire? Um, a lot of people are going to think this is very controversial, but my favourite bit of plant is a bell dumper. So you recently got a ticket in a 360 excavator. How do you find them at Lynch Plant Hire? Challenging, um, but I'm building up my skills slowly but surely um, with a few drivers um, that have been in the game for absolutely ages, pointing me in the right direction and giving me tips along the way. So I'm getting there slowly but surely. Okay, and what do you think about Lynch Plant Hire and why did you choose Lynch to start your apprenticeship at when there's multiple other companies that you could have gone for an apprenticeship with? Um, I chose Lynch for several reasons. Uh, one, obviously my granddad works for them and he's always been looked after by them. And the second reason is because they're more family run, if that makes sense. So you know everyone, everyone's looked after, and there's such a lovely company to work for. Um, I can't say anything bad about them. They are such a lovely company to work for. Um, and their morals that they stand for as well within the industry. Um, so yeah, they're a really good company to work for. So you have a big social media profile and what do you wish to do with that profile to inspire young women or people to join the industry and take on apprenticeships? I want to use my social media platform that I've built to get more people into the industry, especially young people coming out of schools, colleges, and especially women because there's a lot of male dominance in this industry. And I think it's about time it needs to even up and we need to see some more young faces in the industry. So that would be brilliant to hear. And I think that will do it for today. Thank you for coming, Chloe, and see you again soon. Brilliant, thank you. We've let me see, back. Don't do that. See, see you again soon. That was a smooth move, Lucas. Well done, sir. Well done. That was a cracking job. Well done, mate. That's that's really Thank good. You, Mark. Uh, Peter, you've taught him well. Thank you. I think um, the, the thing to mention, Mark, is he um, made all his questions out himself. So I think it's really important that we don't influence what. Uh, young people are doing the, the right questions need to be asked by the right people isn't that right lucas yep definitely 
No, it's absolutely true. Because I, I mean, I, I, if I guessed right, I think you are about thirteen. You know, at, at some point in the yeah. next year or two, you, you're going to be making decisions about your career. And the, the sort of questions you were asking are the sort of questions that you would ask. Mm -hmm. I, I never had the opportunity. I was just, you know, here's a typewriter. Go and make your make a living with that. You know, but I think you're asking the right question. So well done, mate. Yeah, and I think, Mark, as you said, the PlayStation generation is the people that are going to be going into the t cabs as it just seems so easy considering that you've been playing games for multiple years. When I sat in one, it, felt, it just felt right for me. So I think that will be a career that I'd look forward to be trying later uh, on. Well, I'll tell you now, I've got two sons next door who play PlayStation all the time. I wouldn't let them loose with an excavator because they're terrible at Call of Duty. But, uh, <laughs> Lucas, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope to have you on the show again very, very soon. Thank you, Mark. Goodbye. All the best. We've got some competition there, mate. Do you know what? You know, I, I, I really think that these the young kids, it's a natural place to be. You know, they're used to the, all of this. And the way in which we've got to communicate is by letting the people talk to each other, but my, my God, putting them, them together in a safe environment, but also putting them together in the right environment, you know, because obviously when you're looking at social media, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of issues there, uh, unfortunately, but this is why we are bringing again, people into this show, bringing it into a safe environment, having the right conversations that we can share around uh, and 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 get shared around by the right people, you know. And the next generation are going to do that way better than we are, Mark. We can only pioneer a change in the way that people can access information and 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 technologies and new things because we've got those contacts. Safe environment, I think, is a key one. I, I don't want to get too far off the off the, uh, the the beaten track because we have got another interview to uh, to play, but that is a, a real key one. And I think that's one of the things that, that I enjoy about these shows. You know, we've we've had hundreds of people making comments, and they've all been positive, all been supportive. Um, and in fact, they're they're still coming in now. Truck lass, who I think either you or or me, Peter, or based on that. Uh, comment there maybe lucas should go and visit truck last because i think she uh she's she's one of our kind by the sound of things indeed yeah well we've already said very soon for that one mark fantastic stuff okay now i, I did say earlier just before lucas came on the show that um const construction careers aren't just about young people and i did have the opportunity quite recently to speak to a guy who switched careers at the ripe old age <laughs> ripe old age of 40 i remember 40 that was a long while ago um before we talk about it, let's get the uh, the show on the road, and I'll uh, I'll come back and talk about it a little bit more afterwards. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of an apprentice, I tend to think of a young person straight out of school or college. But that isn't necessarily the case. At a time Is when major happening? projects like HS2 are exacerbated, play. Oh, Mark, what's happening? Bear with. I'm going to try it again. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of an apprentice, I tend to think of a young person straight out of school or college. But that isn't necessarily the case. At a time when major projects like HS2 are exacerbating an existing skill shortage, our ability to draw skills and people from other walks of life might just be the industry's salvation. Nigel Bennett is 40 years old, and he spent more than 15 years working as the manager at a special needs care home. But after going through an apprenticeship with material supplier Breeden, Nigel is now a qualified mixer driver. Breeden Stuart Hook takes up the story. Yeah, well, from the employer perspective, apprenticeships provide us with a structured learning program uh, and an opportunity to mould and develop individuals from day one. Um, the apprentices join us with an open mind and an appetite to learn, which is you know really positive. Um, they don't come with any sort of preconceptions about how the job should be done. Um, as they're typically new to the industry. So it gives us a real opportunity to mould our, our colleagues of the future. How did your family react when you told them you were going to do an apprenticeship? There were a few raised eyebrows, yeah. I have, I have family and, you know, I had a mortgage at the time as well when I was looking to change careers. And, of course, the immediate sort of thought when somebody says apprenticeship is that, well, the pay's not very good and you're too old. Um, how are we going to pay the mortgage? Um, which fortunately isn't the case anymore, you know, since the change, the change in law, I, you know, found out I wasn't too old and, and pay was 
better than I was being paid in my previous job. So, do you think that older people are aware of the availability of apprenticeships and that they they are a means to a, a career change? I think there is still that stigma attached to apprenticeships that it's something for school leavers, something because you can't go to university. Um, so there's a, an alternative option, you know, that, because you're not quite so good. And it's that's definitely not the case now with the way that the apprenticeship standards are structured, particularly in England. Um, as Nigel mentioned before, the the salary structure that we put in place for the drivers had to be competitive in the marketplace. We understood that you know, the logistics industry is is very competitive for for drivers currently. It, it's a professional role, so we had to sort of structure accordingly. Uh, and as Nigel said, yeah, it, it's not a, an, a it's not a junior apprenticeship necessarily. It's it's something much more advanced than that. And yeah, we are developing professional drivers. As I said at the beginning, I think most people think that apprenticeships are generally for younger people and that they're used to help mould and, and shape people for life in work. And yet, with people like Nigel coming to apprenticeships later in life, they will bring with them a certain degree of life experience and baggage. Uh, for us, there, it wasn't necessarily about the age. Yes, it's always beneficial to bring new blood and, and younger people into our organisation and particularly into the industry. But ultimately, the key thing for us was when we were interviewing and recruiting people, we were looking for the right behaviours, the right mindset and um, attitude to learning, ultimately. Nigel's apprenticeship was made possible by CTEC Outsource. Here's CTEC's Martin Shepherd. Breeden is obviously a fabulous example of a large organisation that understands the skill challenges uh, within the industry uh, and the, the challenges that they're facing. And they've taken a positive step forward. Uh, and this has proved really successful. Well, Mark, you know, this is the whole point with these things, isn't it? You've just got to really look at it in a holistic context, haven't you? Absolutely, 100%. 100%. I mean, I, I know that that part was, was me talking off the cuff, but that was genuinely my feeling. You know, apprentices are young people, and that's clearly not the case. No, Katie had done ten years in business before she she joined the industry, and and, and Nigel there, had, had, as I say, had, had run a care home for for fifteen years. So, you know, it's never too late, people, if you're out there. Um, now, <clears throat> we we've had more viewers than ever before, and we've had more comments as well. The only problem is that the uh, the system for putting the comments on the screen tonight has been very very glitchy. Um, I've just tried to put up the one from Sean Gratton from earlier. Apprenticeships are the way forward. Uh, never about when I, I started. Yeah, well, shit or bust. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think I think there's a, a degree of people that still believe that, but the, the, that is still out there, you know. The, but there are. You know, I, one of the things that strikes me about tonight's show, and I've, I've already mentioned this once, is the fact that, you know, the likes of Plant Force and Flannery's and Lynch and Sunbelt are are pushing so, so hard. And, and as I think as Katie, uh, Katie rightly said in, in, her, um, in her interview, nobody takes on an apprentice for them to fail. No. You know, you, you've got a, a multi-million pound company basically paying for your training and wanting you, desperate for you to succeed. Mark, it's really expensive to train somebody up. It is not cheap to train somebody up. Yeah. So these businesses are investing a huge amount of capital. They're investing a huge amount of resource in, you know, Jackie's, you know, head of social impact, you know, She's in charge of a team of people that have got to bring all of this stuff together. You can't just make an apprenticeship and make it work. It's not like taking it off the shelf. Dale has said it's taken him years to develop the BTEC course. You know, the, the trailblazer to get government approval with Flannery, three years to get that accredited. This is not small beans, folks. This is massive amounts, millions of pounds. And so... You don't want that investment to walk out the door when they're finished and go out of the industry. Okay, they might leave your business because they might have an opportunity elsewhere, but that's 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 their issue. And but it's actually if you've not given them a career path, and they, <coughs> they should leave. Then actually, that's your fault. So you know, so it, when you've invested all this money here, the last thing you want to do is come to the end of a year, two year, three year, whatever year period. And then go, all right, okay, I'm off to somebody else. No, 
You've got to forge them. And I think what Chloe said was really interesting. She's joined a business, but their attitude, their, their, their culture, the family culture, the caring culture, the you can go and talk to the boss culture. They're not in the ivory tower. You know, Rob and Merrill Lynch, I've known for many, many years, you couldn't want for a nicer two guys. And, you know, if you want to listen to what they're really about, go to Content With Media Podcast I did last year, and they've talked about, you know, age of seven, you know, jet washing uh, in the freezing cold excavator tracks, you know? So, but it's that attitude. And it's also what Christine is saying. Look, she wants to look at, and young, all young people do now, she wants to look at not just the pounds and the pence. She wants to look at the corporate social responsibility of the of the business she's working for she wants to look at the culture she wants to look at the the, the careers or the fit or are they nice people uh, are they going to put me in a nice <coughs> excavator or a dumper that has literally had all of the dump of its you know skip put into the cab you know these are things these are decisions that that people are making and you're only going to be able to get the good operators if you have all of those things you know? I think the other thing about uh, apprenticeships, and I, I think that came across with, with Christina and with Katie and people like that, I think if, if a company has put that support in place, you know, they've put the money in, they've put the support in place, that's that's the starting of, of breeding loyalty. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I Katie was very uh, guarded about not mentioning the her employer. Um purely so she didn't have to go through the, the, the job of getting the, the uh, interview approved. Yeah. But I know that she is a huge, huge fan of her employer. Well, You've had exactly the same with Christina. You know, that, you know I, what, might, might, what might come down the road, who knows? But as it stands at the moment, you know, they have, they have forged relationships with two young, up-and-coming people purely because they've given them the support that they needed. And, I, you know, that's, that's how you, you shape the industry for the future. Yeah, and, you know, you've got to have the right attitude on each side, Mark. You know, it's not just a one-way street. Nothing can be a one-way street. It's a partnership. It's a collaboration. It's actually listening and then acting rather than pushing. You know, the old school thing with me is like, if you hit these 14 boxes, uh, you'll get a promotion. You know, so all you did is wait and look at those 14 boxes and tick them all and go, oh, I've done it. You know, actually, you're not learning a job by doing that. You're not, not, you're not contributing to a team by doing that. You're going, can I tick my boxes faster than that other person that's working next to me ticks their boxes because there's only one promotion place? Utterly ridiculous. Yeah, you know? to totally agree. Totally agree. Um, we are coming towards the end of the show. Um, we've heard a lot about careers and prospects and, and what have you in construction industry before i play us out with what i believe to be a nice aspirational film of some epic machines in action any final thoughts from you peter and i, I know you've got a few bits and pieces coming up so give them a plug while you're about it yeah okay so you know mentioned it before smtgb uh, launching with volvo construction some big big moves from volvo construction globally launching the new um electric uh, excavator and wheel loader system brother uh, machines uh, that's on tuesday at 10 a.m free to come along i'm hosting so it's going to be super fun but actually i've got some big big questions that they're gonna have to answer because i've got them from the from probably the two chrises i call them uh, chris matthew from flannery and chris gill uh, from lynch have already pounded in questions to me uh, that i'm going to put to the panel so you know it's one of those things where i've promised everybody um, that's going to come to that. Um, and I've put a link, by the way, in the feed to, to how to get to that, both on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, that I will get the questions answered to the very best of my abilities. And I've said to SNTGB and Volvo as well, that actually I'm prepared to do a, a show afterwards where I just talk about the questions and give the answers. Uh, and so that that's the right way to do it, Mark. And that's what we're trying to do with these shows. We're trying to get people on when we do do product shows. You know, we get the experts like JCB came on with the Pothole Pro review we did, and they told us the answers to the questions. We have to do that. This is what people want. Otherwise, the people won't bother wasting their time coming on listening to us. No, dead right. And you've also got a few uh, podcasts. I, I know you've you've hinted at them. Where can people find your podcast? Okay. Christine is coming on. I'm going to put her out next week because it's. Uh, I've still got a couple of uh, videos to go out. One with Sunbelts Dan and and who's uh, who was an apprentice got a 
career from that. Uh, and another one with Cullen, uh, who is another Flannery trailblazer. Those are going out tomorrow. Um, but Justine is going to be on the podcast talking about her experiences. Um, and I'm also uh, doing podcasts all the time, Mark. So, you know, we, we've got podcasts um, that have been with the leaders. So podcasts with leadership, I call that. So we've got all the leaders and, and directors. We've t- covered topics like plant theft, hydrogen, electrification, and sustainability, all of those sort of things are on my podcast. Content with media. Search for that on your favorite podcast channel. Uh, find me, and you're going to need a long, long time to listen to them all. And you've done that, Mark. They're in depth. Some of them are up to an hour long. But you know, we're really getting some really big, big inf- information and understanding of the biggest players. And I had Barry, uh, uh, who owns his own business, recently say to me. I've listened to three or four of those, completely opened my mind to the way the industry is going. Uh, and for those leaders to share that kind of knowledge, it's never been done before, um, is really something you want to get your hands on. It's gold. I've mentioned on these shows before that I tend to listen to your podcast while I'm walking the dog. It's now got to the point where if I put the AirPods in, my dogs run and hide <laughs> because they know, they know they could be traipsing the streets for about an hour. So, um, yeah. That they look roughly how I feel by the end of the uh, at the end of the podcast. It Peter, good, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. I I, I know you said that you're presenting uh, the SMTGB thing next week. Uh, you might want to check the post because I've got a funny feeling that Lucas might have got the gig ahead of you. Um, well, you never know. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to let you get back to whatever it was you were doing before I so rudely interrupted you. Uh, I would like to say a, a huge thank you to everyone that's tuned in. We have had a record audience tonight, which is incredible. And uh, we've also had a record number of responses and comments. For some reason, I don't know quite why this is, um, YouTube apparently kicked in tonight. We, we usually have sort of one or two people, but we've had an awful lot over from YouTube tonight. So that's uh, good to see. Um, before we go... If there are any young people out there, and it's not past your bedtime, I do really appreciate you watching, um, and, and well done for sticking with us for as long as you have. To conclude, I could tell you what a great industry construction is, and it is. And I, I could tell you about career prospects and the fact that you'll end up with transferable skills and you know the, the amount of money that you could potentially, could potentially earn. I could tell you all of that. But instead, I'm going to leave you with one final clip. If you work hard, if you're dedicated to the industry, if you're passionate about the industry, this could be your office.